So God bless you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for tonight. We pray you're going to move by your spirit. And Lord, I thank you that you're going to do a mighty thing in each person's life. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. All right, folks, our topic for this evening is entitled Revival. Revival. All right, let's have a look at the definition of revival. Now, I want us to understand something very clearly because a lot of people mix this up in the sense of what the understanding of the term revival. Right? Revival does not mean that God just comes and suddenly there's this mass outpouring of the Spirit of God on a nation. That is not revival. That is outpouring. That is the outpouring of God which man has no say over. Revival by definition means I am reviving myself. I'm getting myself back to where I should be or where I was a little while ago. Okay? So it is really important that revival starts with man who is deciding to push in with God. So it's a decision that man makes. Man decides, listen, I'm going to push in with God. I'm going to get back to God. I'm going to see God move in my life. Now, what is revival going to do? What is the thing that's going to happen to me? What are some of the fruits that I can experience or expect when I am pushing in with God? If I am pushing in with God and we get to that connection and the power of God starts saturating my life, I am expecting certain things. Let's go through them. All right, revival inspires hearts to walk in close fellowship with God under the empowering of the Holy Spirit. You are going to walk very close to God and you're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to help you walk close to God. And you're going to want to be close to God, want to spend time in His presence, want to worship, want to get into His Word. The second thing is it's going to convict souls of their sin and to live holy lives. So you're going to you know, sit down and God's going to deal with you. And you're going to go, I don't want to sin anymore. You know that if you don't have this relationship, very often you want to sin. You know, I hate it when people sit down and say that sin is not enjoyable. They lie. The truth of the matter is sin is lacquer. It's very good for the flesh. But it's only for a season. And the Bible says that the wages of sin, in other words, the rewards, the outcome of sin is death. So it's going to bring death to everything that you touch, everything that you say, everything that you do. <clears throat> and so... But when you are close to God, this reviving and you're pushing in with God, it's going to bring a conviction of sin in your life and you want to live a holy life. It, is, it brings a call to repentance and worship the true and living God. You repent and you say, God, I'm sorry that I was worshipping my position, worshipping my title, worshipping um, my finances. Whatever it may be that you've replaced God, you're going to go back to true worship. God, I worship the living God. And I understand that for some people it's been a crazy time. And this last year it hasn't been easy to get into this place of real worship. But I want to tell you right now, when we connect with God and you have a revival attitude in your life, you are going to have worship flowing in your life. You're going to want to worship the living God in Jesus' name. Alright? It brings healing and restoration to broken hearts. The, the healing is when we are in God's presence and we were saying to God, God, come, restore my broken heart, restore the wounds in my soul. And that is where we come. In God's presence, there is healing. In God's presence, there is joy. All right, so when we come into this type of revival, what are we saying? We are pushing in to get closer to God. We are made a decision. And you must know when the body of Christ makes that decision, the power of God starts moving on the earth. You know, and that's why you'll see even in the New Testament when the church was even praying for Peter and that, and they would stand together and they would pray. They were standing and pushing in for revival. They were reviving themselves as much as they can. You know, it's not many times that you see that the church today will pray right through the night for a situation. You know, we'll pray 10 minutes and then we must go watch TV or go do something. And so you must understand when we talk about a revival, there is a stirring in your heart for God. There is a stirring in God in your heart for God only. And you want to make God your focus and your own central point in everything that you do. Revival quickens hearts to arise with passion and share Christ. Alright, and to reap a mighty harvest. 
When you come into revival, you want everybody to experience what you are experiencing. When you get close to God, you want everybody there and you start drawing people. And you're saying, listen, we need to get you close to God. You need to get back to God. And so as you come to this idea of, listen, I'm going to really seek God, but I'm going to be a magnet. I'm going to draw people. You're going to have a spur of evangelism around you. You're going to prompt, uh, revival prompts men and women of God to fast and pray. In other words, there is a seriousness that comes. And you want to say, God, I am revived to such a point that I want my flesh to get out of the way. And so when we fast and pray, we are putting our flesh aside. And we are saying, we're not going to be ruled by the way that I think or the way that I feel or what I want to do. I'm going to be ruled by the power of God and what God wants me to do in Jesus' name. And so it brings us to a place of prayer. It brings us to a place of fasting and seeking God and trusting God for supernatural miracles to take place in our lives. You see, God is busy with something in each one of us. And I believe God that God is going to do something supernatural in each one of our lives in Jesus' name. And God is going to stir us. God revive us. Bring us back to the place of seeking you again. All right, just like the older generation that used to have prayer meetings into the night. You know, I remember when I was young, we used to have a prayer meeting once a week in our house. And I'm telling you what, the guys would flood into that place, not one or two people, 50 odd people. And they would seek in God's face and they would just pray. There was no preaching, there was no teaching, they would just seek in God's face. And they just prayed and they'd pray for an hour and a half, two hours. And when they were finished, they drank coffee and left. I come back next week and just see God again. I want to tell you right now, there was a spirit of, of revival happening right across our nation. And I sense that this thing is going to come back again. God is going to start stirring up the people again and say, come seek me. Seek me. I am your source. I am your only source. You know, I'm telling you, when there is a revival happening, when people are genuinely getting a hunger for God, they will travel. They will do all sorts of things to get there. I remember one gentleman, he kept working here in Omtata. And he was way out there. Every single Monday night, he would ride through from Omtata to Port Elizabeth, which is about a six-hour trip. And he would fly in there to make sure that he was at the prayer meeting. And after the prayer meeting, he would go all the way back. Now, you don't do that normally. You know, we won't even leave town. It's too much effort and too much... Uh, but let me tell you. When God is hungry, when you're hungry for God and God is moving, I'm telling you right now, God is going to do something in your heart. And you're going to seek God, you're going to fast, you're going to pray. And you're going to say, God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Until the situation around me has been changed and altered. And there is an earnestness that comes with us. You see, the closer you get to God, the more God starts moving in your spirit. The closer you get to God, the more God starts assisting you and helps you to not want to sin anymore. You don't have time for sinning. You are too busy pushing in with God and saying, God, come and touch me. Come and touch my house. You see, God wants us to come back to him, to get a hunger for him and put him first. All right, revival is to say the same thing as another. That is to agree with Okay, and that means that we're standing in agreement with what God's word is. You know, we will sit down and say something and somebody else will say something, but we're saying the same thing. And that is because God is busy with something. And God is drawing us closer to Him. And we are in agreement and we have the same heart and the same passion. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit that's stirring inside of us. And I tell you what, as I have grown up in my years, I have seen a hunger for God. I have seen men and women hunger for God. I've seen God, men and women, that would seek God for hours. And they would just sit and pray. And they would trust God for a supernatural move of His Spirit in their lives. And it stirred up all of these things. This is what true revival is. Now we're praying for revival in South Africa. I don't think we understand what this means. I don't think we understand the depth of the, the commitment and the drawing closer to God. You know, it's very different to what we are generally seeing across the world today. It is genuinely where you separate yourself and you say, God, I seek you and I seek your anointing. I seek your presence. And I thank you, God, that you're going to do a supernatural work in my life. 
That is what true revival is. And so we are trusting God for a supernatural shift of the Spirit of God in our lives. And I know God's going to do something amazing. And God is going to do something for each and every one of us in Jesus' name. Alright, so let's look at a revivalist. What is a revivalist? This is a person who walks around and stirs people up. And starts stirring faith up. Starts stirring a hunger. Starts stirring people to believe God again. So this is what a revivalist does. A revivalist is somebody who comes into your situation and says, come, let's get you hungry again. Let's get you close to God again. Let's go back to the presence of God. Let's go back to the things that you knew. So what do they do? What does a revivalist do in its core essence? Now, I know many revivalists. I know many people that have come. And when they have finished, the power of God is it. See me, Raynard Bonkers one. It should be Rodney Howard Brown. I can name them. These are men that when they come, there is a revival spirit inside of them where they say, come, let's get close to God. Let's revive ourselves again. Let's have that same first love that we did when we first got saved. That first excitement when we gave our hearts to the Lord. Let's get that back. Let's get the fire of God back in our lives. Let's get our lives back into the place of seeking God and the things of God and not worry about the flesh. Okay, so let's see what a revivalist does. A revivalist are restorers of life. All right, and confronters of all that brings death. So in other words, a revivalist is going to come and they're going to stir life in you. And they're going to say, come, come after the life. And they're going to reject anything that's going to bring death into your situation. Anything that's going to show or give any sign of death in your situation. They will reject it and they'll push it out. All right, they'll open the door of newness and renewing of the old. They will start stirring you back to say, come, let's get you back to a new place with God. Renew that old fire that you used to have. Bring you back to the place of seeking God through the night. Or often like a door through which God's spirit in revival can enter. So often they come because they have revived themselves. And the best way I can describe it is, have you ever seen a burning... Uh, Burning piece of wood come close to other wood, to dry wood. It ignites the others. There is a fire, there is a passion, there is an excitement that comes with a revivalist. And when the revivalist comes, he's already on fire. And he's saying, come what I have, you can get there. And it ignites a fire in amongst others. This is why I used to enjoy youth camp so much. We used to go away on youth camps and we had this very strong philosophy. When we sought God, we sought God with all our hearts. But when we played, we played hard with all our might. So we would literally walk out of a spiritual meeting and grab shaving cream or whatever and start playing games. Because we were still young people. We still had fun. We came with our stink bombs and whatever else young people do. All right. And so we used to have fun. But one of the things that happened was when we sought God, we sought God with all our might. And by the time the young people left those camps, and it was just a weekend, it was literally five sessions of spiritual and the rest was social. And let me tell you something, just those five sessions was enough to ignite the hundred odd young people per camp. That they were so on fire for God that they would get back and they would literally go to the streets and start closing down nightclubs. Where did that come from? It started with a revivalist spirit where somebody got on fire for God and said, come, I'm going to ignite you. And all that happened on those camps was to ignite others. And I believe that we need to see that happen more and more in our lives today. All right. They awaken the passion, uh, the passive and the sleeping. They sit down and say, listen, are you going to settle for this? Or do you want to see the power and the fire of God operate in your life? And they come and they ignite that passiveness. And they come and stir up what looks like it was not going to do anything. They were sleeping. But let me tell you something. There is a giant inside of every one of us. And all we need to do is tap into God. And allow the power and the fire of God to consume us again. That's what revival is. A, revival will, a revivalist will bring refreshing. They will come and restore. You might be... Tired, emotionally drained, whatever it is. By the time you are finished, 
You are going to be so on fire for God, ready to move. And you will literally go and look for anything that can move so you can lay hands on it. And release the power of God, release the blessing of God onto it. They stir what needs to be stirred. Alright, they need to stir you up back into action again. They bring healing and wholeness. Because they're bringing the power of God. They're bringing the presence of God with them. And let me tell you something. You can see this right through the Bible. Whenever somebody touched or came close to the power or the presence of God, they didn't want to leave. Obed was the guy who looked after the ark. And he was looking after the ark. And when David came to fetch the ark and take it to Jerusalem, Obed just packed up his whole house and moved to Jerusalem. And said, listen, I'm not leaving. God's presence was with that ark. I'm going with. I want to tell you right now, when you have been in meetings where the true power of God is, I'm telling you, it stirs you up. It brings you to something. And I'm really, I am expecting that to come back to the body of Christ. I'm expecting that to come back to the church of Jesus Christ in South Africa. All right. It, they bring a, a revivalist, rebuilds and repairs what has been broken down. What Satan has come and did come to destroy, they come and they start restoring it. They start speaking life over it, bringing life back. Whatever Satan has stolen, God says that he will repay. It starts coming back in Jesus' name. They bring a reconciliation between us and God again. Bringing us back to the source. Letting us feel the power and the anointing of God again. They turn people back to the point of departure. When did you go off the line? When did you start getting lukewarm? When did you start compromising the gospel from what you knew from when you were younger? What happened? And they go back to that point of departure and they say, come, let's start there and let's bring you back to where you should be. You see, many of us want a revival in South Africa. We want a revival. A revival will change everything. But it starts with us getting on fire first. We have got to be the fire lighters. We have to be the revivalists. We have to be the ones that stir up the fire and bring the power of God in demonstration in Jesus' name. They are capable of God, in God of resurrection, of resurrecting anything that has been broken, which has died and everybody declares dead. They are the ones that can sit down and resurrect it again and say that thing is going to live again. Why? Because they are operating out of the power of God. They bring remembrance of what has been forgotten. They come back and they say, don't you remember the time when you have felt the presence of God? Don't you remember the time when you had a healing in your life? Don't you remember the time when you would sit down and pray all night? Don't you remember the time when you used to hunger for God and go and tell everybody who you could because of the excitement? And what they do is they start stirring you back to the remembrance of where you had departed from your first love and from the fire. And so we need to be the fire lighters. We need to have the approach of saying, God, I want to be stirred up in you. And I want to feel the Holy Spirit move in my life. They are torchbearers. All right. Reigniting fires that have gone out. I want to tell you something. Do you want to be a torchbearer? You know, it's always harder for that initial light to start. I want to tell you. You need to get back to God. You need to seek God and say, God, ignite me again. Stir me up again. Let me be the fire lighter. Let me be the revivalist. Let me be the one that understands the presence and the power and the, and the magnitude of what God has for us. Because God wants to do something supernatural in each one of our lives. I'm telling you right now, this is what revival is. This is what true revival means. Now, I love... D.L. Uh, um, Moody has a model. He said, when you speak about revival, and these are the revivalists of old. And D.L. Moody said, listen, there's a four-step process to revival. And it's a very simple one, and it's taken out of the Old Testament. And I'm going to read it to you. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. This will give you your four steps to revival, and we will deal with it in, in detail now. And D.L. Moody used this, and this is how he ignited revival wherever he went. I want to tell you something. There is something to be said about the guys who lived around the early 1900s. And you hear 
of the most incredible miracles and how they moved with revival in their spirits. And wherever they went, they just stirred up the church. And the church was so powerful in the early 1900s. I want to tell you right now, it's time that we get stirred up again. But this is his basis of his revivals. This is what he did to stir the people on these four pillars. Let's go. If my people are, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. How many of you would like our land healed? Well, let's go back and let's go through the four steps. All right, and it's very important. Number one, if my people who are called by my name, this is the believers, this is not the unsaved, this is you and I, if you are born again, I want you to see this. God's conditions for a national spiritual revival are limited to His people and only to His people. I want to tell you right now, there's not going to be a revival in South Africa unless the church instigates it. Remember, revival starts from the person, from God's people. To be specific, the people that are called by God's name, the Israelites of the Old Testament, and through His Son, the Christians in the New Testament. So if we, who believe God, who trust God, start stirring things up, we are going to start seeing things happen in our lives and in our cities. How many of you want a true revival? We need to revive ourselves. Number two. No, number one is only works through the church. Number two. If the church would humble themselves and pray. Alright. Most people. Most people would have. Put prayer as the first condition. Most people would have said, what is the first thing for revival? They would have put prayer as the first condition. That's not what the scripture says. But prayer without humility is a wasted activity. This is now according to D.H. Moody. D.L. Moody. And he says this very clearly. He says, prayer without humility is a wasted activity. In other words, God come and move. If you don't humble yourselves, God is not going to move through you. If you are going to sit down and have this attitude, oh, I'm going to be the great man of power for the hour, and I'm going to show everybody the power of God, God's not going to move. We need to humble ourselves and say, God, it's not us, it's the anointing in us, the Holy Spirit in us that's going to work through us. Only the genuinely humble pe person can offer a sincere prayer. For he alone is convinced of his helplessness and God is all powerful working through him. Only the humble guy is going to come with a genuine prayer. Only we can humble ourselves. Just as Jesus humbled himself when he obeyed his father and was willing to give his life up in Philippians chapter 2 verse 8. I want to read that to you. And being found in appearance as a man, this is about Jesus, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the cross. So what does that mean? Jesus Christ humbled himself. Only you can humble yourself. God can't humble you and nobody can act like they're humble and not do it. Only you can genuinely humble yourself and say, God, I cannot do this without you. And so number one, we need to understand it's going to be done through the church. Number two, it's going to be done with humility and prayer. Humility and then prayer. Right, next. We need to seek, who seeks my face and turns from the wicked ways. So what, is, what God is requiring of us is that we stand before the person to, before in person to person, face to face, <coughs> strip bare, of our, our, <laughs> of our total, oh God, we're so wonderful, alright? We need to get rid of all of that. And stand completely naked in His omnipresence, open at, 
open to him to search our heart and our minds and giving him absolute freedom to take, alter or replace anything that deems evil, dirty, harmful in us, anything. What do we say? We come and stand there without being superficial and saying, God, come. We ask you please to check our heart, any form of evilness, change our heart right now, because we can't do it ourselves. Take any form of wickedness or evil out of our heart right now, in Jesus' name. Only when you truly gaze into the eyes of the one who is pure and holy, the one who loves you supremely, just as you are, all right, the one who is willing to sacrifice his only son for you, will you be willing to turn away from the pleasures that you cling to through your flesh. Only then are you able to sit down and say, God, you're going to help me let go of this. I understand that you are so great and you are going to help me with these evil issues in my life. Only then will you be able to break free from the spell that draws us back into the forces of darkness. This will be possible for those who have humbled themselves before Almighty God. Who have covenanted to walk with Him continually in prayer. And then you allow the Holy Spirit to do the work in your life. For them the rejection of the world pleasures comes freely. And it will be able to be done. So we need to do those four things. Okay. Humble us. Uh, understand that comes through the church. Humble ourselves, pray, and turn from our wicked ways. What will happen then? Three things come from God. Number one, then I will hear from heaven. In other words, God is going to start moving. This is not just, I've heard your prayer, I'll do something. God's actively going to start moving. Doesn't God always hear? Of course He does. But in scripture, when God says he hears, he's saying that he's going to answer as well. Let me give you a scripture for that. 1 John chapter 5, 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him. That we can ask anything according to his will and he hears us. In other words, he's going to do it. So that he doesn't hear you. It means it's a term that they use in the Bible when he says that he hears you. He's actually going to have some action. So he says then... Once you've done those four things, God is going to move in our lives. God then says, I will forgive their sin. With forgiveness comes a renewal. And a restoration of our intimacy with God the Father. Remember that this is about how close I can get to God. The more I get close to God, the more the power, the fire comes around me. And the anointing of God gets so strong that people are start seeing it and they want to, they are drawn to what's going on in your life. Saints, I want to tell you right now, we need the fire of God. We need a revival in each one of us. But we need to get rid of the sin that is keeping us away from an intimacy. We need to get closer to God as we can. And then he says, then I will heal the land. When God's people fulfill God's conditions, all people experience God's blessing. Not just the saved now, everybody. But it is catalysted by the saved. Scripture reveals the relationship between the spiritual world and the physical. Natural catastrophes can be a sign of God's judgment and prosperity can be an indication of His blessing and pleasure. What does that mean? It means when everything goes wrong in a nation, it could be that the whole nation is drifting off. And we need to get go back and say, God, we as a nation start calling back on you. We call for revival. We call for the anointing. We call for the power. And we need to start getting to that place again as believers. So I want to summarize this. If you want to be a fire starter, if you want to be a catalyst in in God's kingdom to start revival and bring the power of God back. We have to do the following. The four conditions of revival is humbling oneself, prayer, seeking God's face, and turning away from the wicked ways. 
When we get those four things done, God is going to move in our lives. God is going to bring himself so real, make himself so real to you. That you are going to see the power, experience the power. And you are going to see that God is going to draw you to a closer intimacy with him. You are going to want to spend time with him. You want to, want to spend time in his presence. You want to see God move in a miraculous way. I want to tell you right now. I have been in revival meetings. I have seen the power of God move. I want to tell you, the more we seek God, the more God wants to move in our lives. So let's pray together. Lord, I pray right now for each and every believer in Jesus' name. I pray that we are not going to just dismiss this, but God, that we are going to start getting hungry for you again in the name of Jesus. Lord, that we are going to seek your face like never before. Lord, I pray right now that we are going to seek after revival and hunger after revival. But God, we are going to meet the four conditions in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray right now that you are going to move by your Spirit in each one of our lives. And Lord, that we are going to go back to our first love. And that we are going to seek you like we've never done before. Father, I pray right now that as we do, Lord, you are going to help us by your Spirit. To reject sin and get the wickedness out of our souls. And Lord that we are going to see the power of God move in our lives. Like never ever before. And we thank you for this in Jesus mighty name. Lord we release the power of God over our lives tonight. In Jesus mighty name. And everybody said. Amen and Amen.